Tyler, Karen, welcome. Craig, David, welcome, Judy. Yeah, John Twyton. Hi, Katie, welcome. Welcome, Chad. <laughs> and Nancy and Don Glenzer. Welcome, Eric Bakken. Ah, oh, my pastor, one of mine, Seth Hecox, Rick Birch. Welcome. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. And we have Jerry. And because you don't have your picture up, I'm not sure which one, but welcome anyways. And we have Robert Newbert, Rick Bursch. Oh, there's Tim Hansen. Welcome. All right. Oh, Tim, Tim Hansen, nice of you to, to join us in here. I, I just got off a meeting with him and I used my young, fast legs to get over to this meeting a little bit quicker than his old, tired legs. I guess. <laughs> Spoken like a true co pastor. <laughs> Vicki, my uh, iPad says Peggy, but it's Carl. Hi, Carl. Welcome. And welcome, Ramey. Hello. Welcome, Heather and Rick. Good group today. You know, I like to start on time, but um, we started admitting people a little bit later. How are we doing, Robin? Is everyone admitted or are they still coming in? We're good? Okay, well then if you could start the recording, we can keep going here. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, you, Most of you know me, I think by now. I'm Deacon Vicki Hanrahan, Assistant to the Bishop for Synodical Life. and. Whether this is your first webinar or you have joined us before, we welcome you to this consistent pause in our day to have holy conversations with Bishop Ragnus and each other on timely topics for our ministry as we walk together in Jesus' name. Today, we wanted to continue our conversation about returning to in-person worship. Um, we also wanted to get your uh, a sense for how you used uh, Bishop Eaton's sermon this last weekend or intend to use it. And then we'd like to open it up for a conversation about how we are called to walk together as Christians in this time of protests and heightened awareness of racism. So we'll open with prayer and then Bishop Ragnus will give his opening remarks and then we'll open it up for questions. Throughout the hour, feel free to write your questions down in the chat room, chat area, um, and Bishop Ragnus will address those during our conversation. And at that time, we'll unmute you in case you have any follow-up to the question that you asked. And again, as a note, we are recording this webinar so that you can reference it later if you miss anything, um, and for people who are unable to make the live webinar today. So let us open with prayer. Good and gracious God, you know the prayers of our hearts and yearning of our people. Let your light shine on the ways we are called to compassionately distance ourselves and still gather as your people. Bless our time today, Lord, and draw us near to you as we invite conversation and assume a posture of listening to you and to one another. In this time of the protest of racism and not loving our neighbors as ourselves, Lord, forgive us, for we still do not know what we do. As we are imprisoned by our own ignorance, help us to pray as Paul did, 
that your spirit will fill us with love that is overflowing with knowledge and insight so that we may walk with each other with love, kindness, compassion, justice, and mercy. We ask all of this through your holy name. Amen. Bishop Ragnus, I'll hand it to you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you once again for being in conversation together. Um, as I've said, I think every time on these gatherings, we are, um, we um, gain a great deal by being in conversation with each other. Uh, this is not a tuning in to get marching orders from uh, the central office or the CEO. That's not the way the church works. This is um, being in ministry together. And, um, and frankly, I, I learn as much as anything I'm uh, offering. I suspect that's true for most of you when you gather for things like this. So thank you for that. I had Vicki um, uh, yesterday when she said, well, what do you, uh, she and Robin asked, what do you have in mind to talk about this time? Um, I rattled off three, really it's two. Uh, I, I thought I was, I'm curious I just wanted to get any quick comments anybody had on uh, Bishop Eaton's sermon. This was the first time that uh, anything like that's been tried. Obviously, the first time that most of the church is worshiping by video anyway. And uh, so the idea of her offering a sermon um, that would be used simultaneously along the church, uh, across the whole church is an untried and new idea. And so I'm a little curious just to hear if... Um, if some of you used it or or plan to, it was it was uh, written for Holy Trinity Sunday, and in fact, then rewritten again about a week or so beforehand in light of the uh, George Floyd uh, death. Um, uh, but the idea was you could use it any time, um, and, and so I wanted to. I'm interested in a quick response as to whether that was something that was helpful, that was uh, received well, or didn't fit in, or whatever. Um, uh, that fits the category of we're still learning how to live in this new age together. So a little feedback would be helpful. But then the two things, um, we launched these conversations a month or so ago, just to be in conversation about living in such a new time that when we are discovering how best to do all of this. And, um, and then um, a little over two weeks ago, why the George Floyd incident um, recast our whole context yet again. So we have both of those things at work in the lives of our people and of our church um, and of our country. So to be in conversation about um, both, how are we doing in the on the coronas uh, the coronavirus tag um, re planning on returning to worship which now a few of our congregations are beginning to do and and how have you uh, led or how have you listened to your people in the time in these last two weeks in the time of, of um, civic un upheaval that we've been in so first let me just ask and we won't spend a lot of time on this any observations any of you can share with me uh, that would be helpful for others to hear about whether you used Bishop Eaton's sermon or not, um, whether it was helpful, if you have any suggestions for the future, what your people thought of it. Any comments? Um, I, I can say I just received a call from um, uh, Miriam Hall and she was saying how much she enjoyed it and was looking for the transcript to share with some, someone else. So I know that that was appreciated. Good. Um, we put it on our website so congregational members could listen to it. Um, our fourth graders were receiving First Communion on Sunday, so I felt it was important that I preached. Sure. But, uh, yep. Did anybody use it in place of what you had planned for Sunday morning? Doesn't sound like it, huh? It looks like Primrose used it. We used it. 
ELCM Mount, Mount Horeb. We did, and Life used it. We did, yeah. We did. Some of them have been saying it in the chat here. I see that, yeah. I just turned on the chat, so that's that's helpful, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, um, any any comments about uh, how your people responded to it? I haven't heard anything at all. I haven't heard any responses about it at all this week for some reason. I don't know. Hmm. I just got positive comments, and I know that in my congregation, if they were not happy with it, I would have heard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's probably true of a lot of folks. Uh -huh. And I said, I said a couple, um, maybe three or five, maybe a three minute talk on, on my personal comments regarding um, what's happening with George Floyd and the police. I mean, because I, I wanted to have my own, my own voice uh, heard regarding those issues, as well as the bishops. Okay. Yeah, similar, Sue. So uh, I did it in place of my sermon, but had some comments on either side mm -hmm. um, and had a lot of positive feedback. Um, I was very glad that she re-recorded it because when I listened to the first go around, I was like, nope, can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was glad she she redid it to observe the the, the conversation of the day. So that was really positive and, and New Life has always been very active in the, the equity and diversity conversation in the, um, in the Synod. So a lot of response about what's our follow-up as a congregation. So we're looking at reading Dear Church together um, again out of that. Good. Thank you. Others? We used it in our, we plugged it in for the sermon for our video um, online and people liked it. So we had a good response. First English in Whitewater. Thanks good. for that. I'm glad some of you have used it. It's, um, um, I quite apart from the um, value of a content of a sermon, I think just a, uh, an occasional use of something like this just expands um, people's awareness of how we are connected as church and and uh, maybe adds a bit of familiarity to who our presiding bishop is and um, that's all a good thing. Well, let's let's. Uh, this isn't the order in which I mentioned it at the beginning, but let's let's transition from that into the broader topic of, as a couple of you re said, you, you made some comments yourselves. Um, what have you been doing, and what have you found helpful in doing in um, in making reference to or uh, addressing? Uh, the issues that are so prominent now in the news in cities across the country, uh, not even cities, but to small towns as well, various demonstrations. Um, how, how have those uh, topics been addressed in your congregation, either through your preaching or in conversations with people? Uh, what do you sense is going on where you live? Uh, Dick England at Sugar Creek Lutheran in Elkhorn. We uh, had 24, on Thursday night, uh, we had 24 people come for um, conversation on race relationships in context of our Christian faith. And so we were outside, we had masks and we social distanced. Um, and they came, the very focused conversation uh, they came away with their own understanding that they don't know anything, that they're very, that, that we just don't have the data and experiences personally. Um, they also understood about confession and forgiveness, uh, well, more confession and ignorance, and want to learn more, and then want to connect with uh, 
uh, we have a relationship with Midvale and Madison as a rural urban group. And so we also, um, and I was just, I just came from uh, a meeting with Ken Smith on that, but uh, we also want to try to work together on that. Where we're going to go from there is uh, we wrote up the, the response, gave it to the congregation to uh, a report. Um, and we're going to try to seek out some educational pieces to lay the found work for some relational pieces in the future. So that's, that was our immediate response and had a, I would say for our congregation, that's a really good response for adult ed and for that conversation. So. Dick, can you say a little bit more about when you sent out the invitation to your people to come to this, um, what did they understand themselves being invited to? How did you tee up the conversation? Uh, we said that it was about a Christian response or a Christian, how are we viewing race relationships in our community, state, and nation uh, from our basic Christian faith? And we, from our Christian faith, and we rooted it in our baptism, we're in baptism. Um, and they, they, and they, they were told that they were there to listen and to share and what was going to be heard and said might be painful. Um, but this was a safe place to do that. And they were really good about it, I, I thought. Um, but we rooted in our baptism, in baptism confirmation and, and the call process, you ask people to um, speak, on, speak to justice and peace in all the earth. And you call your pastor to do that. And so we rooted the faith piece in our baptism. Yeah, I, thank you for sharing with me when you were sending that out. I was impressed by the way you had invited people in and said this is... Uh, made it very clear we aren't just having a political discussion, we're discussing the implications of our faith in the context of issues around race that are going on. I thought you had done that very well. Um, others of you uh, that either may have had structured or unstructured conversation with some of your people and or addressed it in some way in your preaching these last couple weeks. Um, Naomi Garber from uh, First English in Platteville, the intentional interim here. It's not a conversation that's happened yet, but I want to extend an invitation to anybody who might want to join in. Um, I've had a number of people ask, how do we talk to our children about this? What kinds of resources are there? What can we do? And so um, I'm going to try and put together a Zoom meeting for those people who would not have that kind of conversation. If you're interested, please just let me know um, and I'll add you in. Like I said, it won't happen until next week, but um, there are some resources available that we could provide to parents and grandparents, um, educators to talk about how do we frame this from a Christian perspective for our children? So I just want to extend that invitation in case anyone would like to join in. It's a great invitation. I think um, kids, are, kids may act like they're simply playing with their toys, but they're taking all this in. They can't help but see it. If the news is on, if... Um, even folks who have tried to shield kids from, I heard, I've heard a couple stories about people who said, I just don't want my kids to be aware of that. They're, the kids are aware of it. They just are. I, um, my 19 year old son showed me Elmo asking his dad about protests hmm. um, from Sesame Street. It was a really good piece. Nice. Yeah. I addressed it the last two Sundays in my preaching. Um, you know, a week ago it was Pentecost and some, you know, the Tower of Babel, Pentecost, division, uh, and, and, and said we didn't need one more reason for people to see other people as different. So at Pentecost, God kind of brings us together with one spirit, but uh, dressed addressed all the isms that separate us, that we've used to separate us, and ended with racism and what was happening in Min I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. So uh, I've been watching it pretty closely. And, um, you know, last Sunday, 
I addressed Paul's letter to the second Corinthians where he's addressing some issues, naming it so it can be dealt with and, and kind of shared it. It's a relief finally for the secret to be named. There's racism. And now that it's been named, we can deal with it. That's not a great way of summarizing my sermons, but I mean, I mean, it's been named. So now, and it's out in the open, finally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Robin and Vicki, if you see people raising their hands, I can't see everybody on one screen, obviously. So if you could click back and forth and see if there are others. We're kind of listed in alphabetical order too in the chat room. If you would say your name before you make your comment, that would help us find you on the screen too. My name is wrong on the screen. No. Because <laughs> I downloaded from my old computer. <laughs> my well, married know. name on <laughs> instead of my real Christy Earth from Fenimore. <laughs> Well, the, mis the mystery voice was very helpful. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think, let me, um, let me say this. I, I, uh, there are a few of you that maybe were on the Zoom call I was on this morning, so I might be repeating myself for you. But I remember going, um, I remember years ago uh, going to a, um, preaching seminar that was being led by Barb Lundblad, who was ELCA pastor who preached, uh, taught preaching at Union in New York. But, um, and, and she was talking about domestic violence, but she said, um, all of you in your congregations have uh, domestic violence is a reality someplace in your membership in your congregation, and it's very difficult to deal with from the pulpit, but, and you don't have to, uh, she said, you don't have to preach a sermon about it. You don't have to figure out that you are experts about it. But here's the value of naming it. Number one, if you make reference to it, uh, you do two things. First, uh, you make it clear that that's a reality and it's a concern of the church and belongs in the church's conversation. And secondly, you give indication that you as a pastor in that place are someone for whom, uh, with whom, somebody experiencing domestic violence could go and have conversation. Just saying it, saying the words in the course of your preaching says that. And I think, um, and I think whatever we seek to say about racism or justice or inequality or violence or um, the things that are swirling around us today, whatever we say announces those two things, that they are, these are um, germane for our life as Christian people. And secondly, I am one who is ready to have conversation about it, either individually or in a group. I did a, um, I don't, uh, some of you are aware, some may not be that um, back when this started and some people said, we're going to have to go on online and we don't know how to set all that up. Uh, the suggestion was made that if I would do a sermon each week, they could, somebody could figure out how to use that. So I've been doing that each week. Uh, I think most of you use your own sermons. That's fine. So it's, I doubt if it's used much, a few people have said, well, they look at it at the beginning of the week just to get sermon ideas. What I did this week might be worth looking at. i recorded it yesterday. I suppose it's posted today or will be soon. Um, um, but it's based on the premise that most of the people in the congregations of this synod, in the congregations where you at, are, are pretty mainstream white Lutheran folks, um, not living in um, a highly urban, uh, highly diverse community. And most of your people sitting in the communities where most of our people are see documents that say as church folks, we must repent of our racism and we must repent of the sin of white supremacy. And they probably scratch their head and think, I'm not sure what to make of that because I don't think I'm a racist and I'm certainly not a white supremacist. So what's it mean that our church documents are saying 
we ought to um, confess our complicity with racism and white supremacy in the um, in the church. Um, I don't know, I'm, and certainly in just a few minutes, I didn't unpack that um, in a comprehensive or even fully revealing sort of a way. But, but my sense is uh, we need to somehow begin to find ways to draw people into that conversation. If we're at a point in this culture of potential systemic change, um, that has to be pretty broad. That for as many tens of hundreds of thousands of people have been in demonstrations, that's a pretty small drop in the bucket of a 350 million population country. So we have to draw more and more people into that conversation. And our people, as Christian people, based on our principles, need to know how to do that. So whether I did it very well or not, I don't know. But I, I hope that we try and figure out ways to have that conversation begin to happen in our con congregations in ways that people begin to look at themselves and ourselves as church and not just um, it's now on the table as a problem that somebody else ought to fix someplace else. This is uh, David Fremming in uh, Lancaster. Can you hear me? Yep. I uh, took the approach from Edwin Friedman of Family Systems and thought about asking the question, what has been your experience of black people? And told a story about growing up with a mother who's terrified of black people and a father who isn't. What was the difference between my mother and father? My father was a corporal in the Army Air Corps uh, as a medic in World War II in Europe. And so we well, trained with black people at Maxwell Airfield in Montgomery, Alabama. So I think that was a big change. And then treating the wounded was he didn't see color. He just, he, when he treated people, he saw an American. And I, I shared that story. I also had a good story of white privilege from my wife's family, which is rather large, of uh, a nephew driving with two black friends getting pulled over by the police and the two black people are frisked and searched and the white person isn't. And then the two black people get back in the car and, and say to the, uh, say to the white family member, it's a good thing you were with us or we would have spent the night in jail. So just sharing these real life illustrations and asking the question, what is your experience? Uh, and you brought up the word complicity, Peter, and that's what I did go there and say, so, you know, we say, well, we still, we don't have any problems here. You know, everything's fine here in Grant County. Or, but we vote. You know, I brought up Luther's letter on Christian liberty. You know, we're called to be citizens who vote for good government governance. And so talked about who do we vote for? What what do they stand for? What do they do for black people? Or what are they? You know, if they're not if they're not uh, if not, if they're not for their voting rights, if they're not for their education, if they're not for their housing, you know, what are we doing? So I just raise those questions. Nice, good. Jane. Um, one of the things I wanted to to raise was communities are starting to hold discussions. In DeForest, um, the president of the village happens to be a member of Christ Lutheran Church, and he and the chief of police and um, one of our village trustees who is a black, black woman and a doctor who runs social programs are chairing a community conversation on, on the event, on, on policing and on protest and racial equity. And um, I think that's an important discussion for us members of the church to participate in. I've noticed a growing number of those conversations starting to happen in Wisconsin communities. And I would encourage our church leaders to participate in those um, because it's a place to shape opinion. Um, so I was real glad to see this happening and I hope it, hope it goes well. 
I also wondered, and maybe he already said this, I apologize for being late, how Dick Inglet's um, presentation or, or discussion last Thursday went. You should have been on time and you would have heard it. <laughs> I know, Dick. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. I'll, seriously, okay. give me a call and we'll talk about it. All right, thanks. Yep. But I'm not, I'm not surprised, Jane, that you're asking about that because it really was a fine example of calling people into conversations that are, that need to happen. Okay. Others of you, what other kinds of conversations are you hearing? Peter? Yeah. This is Rob Kosky at St. Paul's in Waterloo. And one of the conversations I've had a, a couple of times in the last week is with my church secretary and her husband is a police officer um not a madison police officer but he's been called into madison every day over the last week and a half and um the pain and the anxiety that she and her family or two little kids are going through um through this um you know he's worked like 100 hours in the last week and you know he goes into work at 11 and comes in the morning and comes home the next morning um and then listening to chants that are against the police and um it's just been a very painful time for their family and um i guess just trying to be aware of that dynamic also especially if we have people in our congregations who are police officers um, they're going through a lot mm -hmm. as well right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, um, um, as you know, when you've had discussions of, uh, diversity or anything like that, I, I'm, an important place to start is simply by emphasizing the need to listen to one another's experience, uh, whether that was going back to sexuality discussions or any discussions that uh, where people have strong feelings that not, don't always go in the same direction. It's largely because people have different life experiences. And um, I remember some of the, uh, I began ministry in the early 70s in the central city in Milwaukee shortly after there had been the civil unrest there in that city. And um, uh, by the time I got there, the, the riots were uh, three, four years in, um, in the rear view mirror. But what was now going on were uh, li simply listening sessions where people from the African American community were, were sitting down with congregations that had police officers in them and beginning to have some conversation and discovering all kinds of common ground. You know, everybody wants safe communities. Everybody wants the criminal element com um, controlled. How do we do that work in a way that um, how do we find common ground and do that work together? Um, the, yeah, the anti-police rhetoric right now is, of course, at fever pitch, played by um, the few officers that have um, that have overstepped their own bounds, but that paints the whole um, the whole department with one brush that isn't fair either. We just need to hear those stories. I um. I would like to share something. This is Katie Bartseth. Um, on Sunday afternoon, I went to the Solidarity March and I biked down and I guess I just have a narrative account for the group. And that is that I kind of checked in with a couple members who were at the march. And then I went to the um, entry of the march and talked to some fellow clergy. And then I went back down to meet a couple of members farther down on the the parade or the route, sorry, not parade route, but route. Anyway, and then um, when I was down there, I saw a police car. And so I thought I'd just go over because we've been praying for everybody, including the police throughout this whole week. And I went over and approached because I had my clergy um, shirt on and they opened up the window. It was two female Madison police officers. And I said, hey, I, I just want you to know we're praying for you. 
and we think about you a lot and I hope that you're doing okay. And they said, thank you. And they both smiled at me and they said, we can feel it. And I said, we think the world of you. And they said, we think the world of Madison. And then they said to me, are you here for the protest? And I said, yes. And they said, good for you. Um, have a great day. And it was a wonderful interchange with our Madison police on Gilman and State. And um, I think that bearing this together is something that we do. And I, I wanted to share that anecdote because it was really healing for me. I'll sign off now. Great story, Katie, thank you. Others talking about what's been going on and how you've led in these days. This is uh, Blake, Katie's partner. Um, and I, I just wanted to share uh, something that I, I don't know if you, we've talked about it today a lot, but um, Anna Madsen, who many of you know, had a blog post this week about uh, the God of meeting people where they are. And I think it was a really uh, powerful post in the sense that it's so often as pastors, we're called to, we think, love our people and meet them where they are and listen to them. And she suggests that maybe as a church of privilege and as people of privilege, that's allowing people to stay where they are and we're all in the wrong places. And maybe this is a moment where we really aren't supposed to meet our people where they are, but we are supposed to call them into where they should be. And it's not supposed to be a comfortable time. And I would commend her blog post, but just that whole concept as pastors of, you know, we think we need to meet our people where they are, but uh, there's that prophetic call that we all often feel the tension with. And I think this is a really important dynamic to think about now. Yeah, Paula Geister, Jones, Christ Lutheran in Stoughton. Uh, um, on Trinity Sunday, I talked, you know, the God whose love for us is everlasting and steadfast, but whose love for us that can also be tough who will speak the truth to us whether we want to hear it or not, like the Old Testament prophets, and then Jesus who died for our sins, and the Holy Spirit who pushes us where we may not want to go, but we need to go, and gives us the courage and the desire to face the truth. That, uh, I, the, um, the whole issue of discomfort is an important one, I think. I had heard, um, I, I think it was David Fremming, wasn't it you, who forwarded to me that speech by uh, Father Massengale, who um, has Milwaukee roots, um, now teaches out at Fordham, but an uh, African-American Catholic priest who um, had spoken on civil rights and one of the comments or, or spoken on race and one of his comments uh, was that our problem in the church is that our our conversations around race are proscribed are proscribed by white comfort levels that is we're willing to have these conversations as long as it doesn't get too uncomfortable and then the conversations get shut down and i think part of um Part of the risk we take is just saying, what if, what if we encourage our people to hang in there, even if conversations are a bit uncomfortable? Um, educational people will say that's often where learning begins to happen is when comfort is left behind. Well, thank, thank you for mentioning uh, Brian Massengale. I think he's a, a good source. Uh, I was at his ordination with my wife and great time in Milwaukee. And uh, I also also uh, also uh, write music, and uh, some of it's trending toward protest. So uh, I write with somebody in Australia, Lee Newton and Adelaide, and uh, we we have a a pretty strong piece uh, in the making. But uh, I put up a a link to something that uh, off of John fourteen six. I am the way. So. 
uh, feel free. And if any of, any of you want uh, piano music to it, let me know. It exists. So uh, that's another another piece. I hope to make a contribution to protest music. Um, in the time that we have left, let me um, let's let's take a little bit of time to talk about um, where you are with um, reopening converse, uh, congregations. Because I think increasingly now I'm hearing stories of some beginning to do that, um, and often doing it in um, uh, in very uh, cautious kinds of ways with lots of safety protocols in line or in place. I've been glad to hear about all that. Um, beginning to hear a number of stories about when opening cautiously, there are still a lot of congregational members that are cautious about coming. So numbers are often down that I suppose as we experience that, we shouldn't be surprised by that. That just means they're taking the admonition to be cautious and safe seriously. Uh, but what have some of you ventured into in these last couple of weeks or are about to? What kinds of plans do you make? What have you found to be um, helpful procedures? Uh, Paula Geiser Jones at Christ Lutheran in Stoughton. Um, our council's meeting tonight to make decisions. But I really think we'll continue our drive-in services with the radio, um, even through September. And then we're thinking of starting some Wednesday night devotionals. We'll have a campfire and like Central Park, we'll, we'll paint circles on the grass where family units can, can gather. Uh, and we'll put them six feet apart. But uh, it, it's kind of troubling because people are acting like, there's no danger anymore. You go to stores and nobody's wearing masks. But I think that's what we'll be doing. Okay. Uh, Nancy, Robbie, Holy Trinity, Marshall. We have an excellent five person task force we've put together that has experience in these different areas that we'll be needing to look at. And so we're working through this very carefully and very intentionally and we don't intend to reopen until we are convinced that we have the procedures as safe as they can possibly be. So that may not be for two couple of months still, even though there's a lot of pressure to move more quickly, but we're gonna be firm on that. Was there a meeting this afternoon? Others? Drilling mm -hmm. at St. John's and Prairie de Sac, um, one of the things that has um, pushed, I think, the issue for me um, a bit is the fact that we have announced that we're going to have a Senate Assembly August 1st, and so the 12 congregations, or however many there are, that have decided to be sites, um, we being one of them, uh, opens up for us the reality of, oh, if we're going to do this, then why aren't we doing something else? Um, and so that, I think, is just a, a reality that uh, has come, up, come, come upon us because of the date. We, we have had some... Um... We've had some conversation with, uh, uh, with I don't know if it's more than one congregation that was approached and was quite open to being a site and then has, and then had to uh, think about that a little further because they hadn't, they aren't open yet as a congregation um, for their own in-place worship. Um, and that's, I understand that, that's an awkward position to be in. Um, we will be very, uh, very clear that um, that safety protocols will be in place and that uh, no more than 50 will be in any other spot that holds uh, many more than 50. So there'll be plenty of room for distancing, even things like lunch, food service, people will say people bring your own. Uh, so there'll be very little interaction. Um, and and we're assured that, that 
um, we won't be running afoul of any government guidelines at that point. The, it's not uniform across all counties, but it'll be, um, I mean, many ha some places have 50 as a minimum, some have 25% of, of, of a facility's capacity as a minimum. Um, we'll be very respectful and very cautious in the, in the gathering. At the same time, I don't, um, I, I hope it's not taken as a sign that says somebody who's deciding to hold off in-person worship until September is somehow being scolded or they're in, or the Synod believes they're in error waiting that long. Uh, we've said all along, caution, um, caution is important and, um, and it's good to be um, caring for your people in ways that inform these discussions. And if that means uh, deciding to wait until as long as September, there's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that decision. That's... Uh, Got that in. Mm -hmm. Those of you who that have opened, can you share uh, or have tried something uh, for the first time in the last week or two or three? Um, what were you expecting and how has it turned out? What have you experienced? Um, I can share something. This is Katie Bartseff. Uh, I had a funeral, I think it was maybe a week and a half ago. And uh, I had planned for it to be outside, but then it was clear the night before that it was going to storm during the time we would planned to be outside. So I needed to switch gears and find a way to welcome them into the sanctuary. And I asked if they might consider having 12 or fewer people. It ended up being about 16. I did instructions outside before we went in. We entered in one entry. Uh, we came in, I asked them to space and wear masks. Um, we had a brief uh, funeral service inside with all the windows of the sanctuary open for the 16 members of the family. And then we walked out a different door doorway. Um, then I went with them to the burial, which was outside and then returned back to church and disinfected all of uh, everything once we were finished. Um, it went pretty well, but I'm definitely um, asking people if they might consider having funerals outside as a preference, weather permitting. So that's something that I've done recently. Helpful, thanks. Uh, Naomi Garber at First English in Platteville. I can't out how to get people in and out of the building. So we we have a lovely West Lawn, so we're having a West Lawn worship. We still can continue with YouTube and our radio broadcast earlier. So we've had two Sundays outside. Um, the first Sunday, 47 were there. Last Sunday, 27 were there. They all come with their masks. And the thing that I've noticed outside is, is that it's okay to stand a long ways away from somebody else and have conversation and feel like you're connected with them. That doesn't feel the same inside. Inside, you, we tend to want to be in closer proximity. So even the people that have stuck around and visited, um, they, they are socially distant. And um, because everybody's wearing their masks and we're outside, um, and they kind of are in a long row in, in the shade of the building. Um, last Sunday, I did lead a couple verses of song in a cappella, and I think that felt good for people to be able to sing, knowing that we probably won't be able to do that when we come in. So, um, but people are very tentative, even coming outside. You can just see in their faces, they are scared and they're not sure they should be doing this and is it safe? And so uh, we, intern Jamie and I lead with our masks on and we stay distance from each other and from the people. And um, 
I'll see how it goes, but we're going to be outside. We've got a lawn. We've got the PA system. We figured that out. And uh, until someone more creative than me figures out how to get in and out of the building safely, um, that's what we're going to be doing this summer. And I think, Naomi, you said, didn't you, that um, when you sang, you were all standing in one broad line, so nobody was singing projecting right. forward to anybody in front of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the people are in one great big long line and we're outside and they have their masks on. So it felt safe. I mean, I felt yeah. safe um, as a worship leader. If I didn't, I wouldn't have done it. But I felt safe doing that outside. Yeah. I would not say, feel safe inside. Yeah, good. Good. Well, I think these kind of this kind of um, simply sharing with one another uh, the different ways uh, you think about going about it, and having the then turning around and having those conversations with people in your own leadership circles within your congregation, we're going to come to different differing kinds of conclusions and experiences, and probably won't know until down the road a ways. What's, what has been the most effective? We're all in sort of an early part of the learning curve. Um, so I think, I think having conversations with one another and sorting this out and getting, getting a hold of the pieces of advice, the, the sorts of things that were issued early on by the ELCA and by uh, the Wisconsin Council of Churches, as well as CDC. I mean, all of those, all, they may be several weeks old now, but all of them are still germane. Um, the numbers tell us that the virus um, slows down in some places, picks up in other places, but increasingly leaders are using the language of we're just going to have to learn to live with this. This is uh, going to be with us for a while. It's not about to go down and be in all in the rearview mirror. It's going to, it's going to, it's, um, uh, the, the, some of you know that I'm, uh, that my safe at home has been in Minnesota these past few weeks and the commissioner up here just said, um, statistically we are plateauing and we expect uh, that one good scenario is we, are st we stay on a plateau for a long time, which means the same number of new, new, uh, new cases will keep arising, number of deaths will keep, um, will stay steady, will be with us for a while. This is not simply gonna go away so that by September we can have a rally day that looks like all other rally days and carry on programmatically as we always have before. This is, this is gonna to continue to be different. I hope one of the things we haven't said, you haven't made comment of one way or another, but, but I know just anecdotally from the conversations I've had with a number of folks that even as Congregations have begun to do some things for in-person <laughs> gatherings. Um, the online work continues. Uh, we had some conversation last week, some of you were on that, about uh, how do you simply stream what you do on Sunday morning so it's not two paths of preparation, but however you go about doing that, that is one more way of both connecting with the people who are not yet uh, feeling safe about regathering and demonstrating that you continue to be a church for all. Um, and I think I've, I've been very pleased. I've admired a great deal the ways that uh, pastors have led these days, that uh, you have cared for your people, found new ways to care for your people. I continue to be concerned a lot about um, um, about the toll that it takes as this time goes on and you keep having to figure out how to live in a new world. Um, I had written previously, I continue to encourage, be, be sure and take care of yourself, find ways to step back, um, disengage for a time, uh, vacation or days off or continuing ed or those kinds of breaks that were typical in our worship style, maybe harder, I mean, leadership uh, patterns may be harder to figure out how to do that in days when you can't take off and travel and go to other things. But that time of disengagement and of taking care of oneself and withdrawing from other stuff, that to keep a balance in our lives, 
that's just an important thing to continue to find ways to do. So I hope you, I hope you tend to that. Um, we're concerned that lay leaders in your congregations are aware of that, and um, we've we're in conversation figuring out ways to have that brought to their attention as well. I mean, we're this is stressful. Leading in these kinds of days are stressful, and I'm. I'm in awe. I admire how you've stuck with it and how you've coped faithfully in each of your places. I th I think um, I've said this in some, I don't know if I've said this in this gathering. I also think it's a testimony. Um, it's a testimony to how well you have led that congregational financial life has remained as steady as it has. I hear very little uh, alarm bells going off saying our ship is sinking. Nobody is giving anything anymore. The people are being pretty faithful, but I think um, I think that's because you in your ministries with them have been faithful. And there is still a sense of we are church and we are finding ways to continue to be church. And it's something that's important in our lives. So that's a little more of a sermon than I planned on giving at the end. But um, but I do want you to know that you are, I, th I think you are doing magnificent work where you are toiling away. And I'm, I hope it continues and I'm grateful for your work and I'm hoping you take care of yourself in the midst of it. On that note of stewardship, I wanted to uh, commend one upcoming webinar um, it's the stewardship webinar happening this Thursday at three o'clock. Uh, for more than a year, the ELCA has been focusing on cultivating generous congregations. And Reverend Larry, is it Strang Bishop? Is that how you pronounce his name? Strang, Larry Strang, and his Lake Institute trained team have worked with more than a hundred ELCA congregations, and this has led to three <laughs> strategies. Uh, recognizing the impact of negative influences, the pandemic and scarcity thinking for one or two, cultivating generosity leaders and developing a culture of generosity in your congregation and households. So um, you can join Reverend Larry Strang for this webinar to talk about these three strategies and how congregations can be proactive in nurturing generosity. And that Zoom meeting will be on Thursday, June 11th. Uh, this Thursday at three o'clock and we did post it in what matters I'll post a link again in what matters tonight so do pay attention and join in if you can should be worth your time any final comments Bishop before we before we close no I um, um, it's it's worth uh, you don't have to go this session has been recorded i'm not saying i'm not saying you ought to go back and rewatch the whole thing but if you weren't paying attention to comments and questions that were popping up in the chat room there are some things there that are worth um grabbing hold of so links and so on to some things that have been talked about are there as well and well, thanks once again yeah, and thank you for your sharing too, because if you've noticed in Connected Community, I'm taking some of those ideas out of the chat room and repeating them in Connected Community for in case you missed the links or what have you and for anyone that was unable to attend the webinar. So thank you for sharing and uh, sharing your ideas and your recent surveys um, that we sent out. We continue to uh, highlight those ideas and this next week in Connected Community will highlight the stewardship things that you're doing, creative stewardship things. So we'll share that uh, with the whole synod on those things. So um, thank you for joining us again and attending this Equipping the Saints webinar. As always, it was better with you here. God bless. Thank you all.